All right, welcome back to a, another episode of uh, Shop Talk. I'm uh, Brad Goldberg, joined by Dan DeLucia, and we are very, very excited to welcome on Adam Flutko, former UCLA Bruin, uh, College World Series MVP, not bad, um, current Cleveland Indians right-handed starter. But thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I wanted to make sure I left no doubt that I went to UCLA. So I tossed on, <laughs> this is the winning uni from the College World Series when we beat, this was on field when we beat. That's game State. use. Not, absolutely. Did you wash it? Did you wash no. it? No, absolutely <laughs> not. I still think I got some Rosenblatt dirt all over me somewhere, <laughs> or TD Ameritrade field, sorry. Right. Did you pitch that game? No, I threw game one. And then that was let's, game two. Let's, uh, let's start there. Let's start with your College World Series experience. Uh, that team obviously was pretty special. Um, and you had just an unbelievable year, and, and it kind of culminated in you being the World Series MVP. Can you talk about that year and, and obviously pitching in TD Ameritrade. I, I'm pretty sure you went 2-0 and o in the College World Series, correct? Yeah, yep, exactly. That, that team was uh, pretty special. I mean, all three teams that – I was a part of at UCLA were pretty special. My freshman year, um, the starting pitching staff was Garrett Cole, Trevor Bauer, and then myself. And so, I mean, that alone is a pretty um, fun weekend rotation every single week that we were going. And it, it, was, it was fun to be a part of, um, learned a crazy amount. The next year, um, I was the Friday guy, but we went into – playoffs as the number two ranked national team and we made it to Omaha we ended up getting bounced we won the first game played Stony Brook beat them and then we lost against University of Arizona and Florida State and then we went home so after that 2012 year I think uh, a lot of the older guys were pretty bummed out because we felt like man we were we were the best team in the country no matter what no matter what the rankings and everything like that said so 2013, we actually, um, I say this in all seriousness, that was probably our least talented team that we had across all three years that I was at UCLA. But we just had uh, really high discipline and really high standards. Uh, we, led the, we led the nation in fielding percentage, and uh, we used that to our advantage. It was nine guys versus one hitter constantly. And um, the pitching staff as a whole, uh, did their job and I think that showed I think we gave up four runs in five games something like that uh, five runs and five runs in five games something to that effect uh, when we were in Omaha and uh, the defense continued to play out that's awesome so I, I want to talk about kind of a winning culture that follows you I did a little bit of research you want to you want a state championship in high school too huh yep so you've won a High school state championship in California, which is uh, obviously one of the hotbeds of baseball in America. You won a NCAA championship at UCLA. Then uh, you get drafted by the Indians. And, and it seems like since you've been there and since we've known each other that all they've done is win. Um, do you talk about similarities between the three teams or, or the cultures in, involved? Yeah. Uh, it's or is it just you? A Are you just a winner, man? <laughs> I love to win, but it's not just me. Like, let's be very, very clear about that. Winning is first and foremost on my mind every single, every single day that I take the ball and for whatever uniform I'm wearing that day, that's, that's the most important thing, but it's been culture. Just like you said, it's the chemistry of the team. It's um, all three of those teams, the 2016 Indians team. I have an ALCS ring from it because that was when I made my debut and I have a couple minor league rings to go with all of those uh, other rings that you mentioned. And I take pride in all of those. I mean, every single one of those means a, means a whole heck of a lot to me. And um, I, like I said, I think culture, I think the band of brothers and the group of guys that stand together and, and, and are there every single day that matters. And it mattered to me and uh, discipline matters for me. I think the best teams I've ever been a part of are the most highly disciplined teams that, if a guy doesn't, you know, run to first base, uh, it's not even a coach that gets to him. It's a, it's a, it's a player that does. And that was evident even last year. Um, funny enough, in the big leagues, when Yasiel Puig did that 
terrible mistake and he admits it where he he just walked back to the dugout after hitting a ground ball first terry francona couldn't even get to him because there were three or four other guys um including francisco lindor and carlos santana that sat him down before tito could even get to him that's awesome now that's uh accountability at, at, at the highest degree dan you got a couple questions uh, yeah, so um, this is more for, you know, potential guys. We've, we've talked with other guys before um, about, you know, the, ex the college experience, going to college. You were drafted out of high school in the sixth round and decided not to sign and, and to go to college at UCLA. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that decision process and, you know, what, what went through that? It was uh... – it was a long decision process, to be honest. Uh, Houston made, uh, at the time, was truly a, a life-changing amount of money um, for me and my family. And I was, I was ready to grab it. But at the same time, I was looking at five years down the road. And I didn't know if taking the easy money now would produce the results of being a major league player and consistently being a major league player. I think there's, those are two very different things. Um, and I wanted to be an every single day major league player. I didn't want to just um, get there. Uh, I want to, I still have aspirations. I want to be an all-star. I want to, you know, open opening day kind of stuff. We, as we talk one day after opening day, like all of these things are aspirations of mine that I still have for today. So thinking back to that 18 year old kid who sat down and was given this amazing offer by the Houston Astros, I just knew that, for the course of my baseball career and education was going to be important. And that's not something you can put a number on as far as value. And I knew that if I went to UCLA and studied under John Savage and, and, and you know, took the classes and everything um, and, and got an education as well, then I was going to be way more ahead than monetarily that could, that could even quantify. So if, can I expand on that? So, so Adam Plutko now in 2020, besides this uh, global pandemic going on, do, do you see it as a big win, that decision now um, where you're at with baseball and you met your wife at UCLA? Yes. Yep. So you're, you're a family man. You have a kid. You met your wife at UCLA. You're obviously in the big leagues. Where do you, where do you kind of take that opportunity cost now? looking back at that decision, are you happy with it? What do you, you know, how do you feel about it now looking back? I mean, I couldn't be happier. I was drafted five or six rounds later um, out of college than I was out of high school. I was offered significantly less money and I, I couldn't, I couldn't sit here today and say it was a bad decision. It was 100% the best decision that I made. Um, would, more money have been nice when I was 18. Sure. Of course. Um, why wouldn't it have, but I was, I've been talking to Garrett Cole because we had a bunch of major league baseball players association talks. And I was talking with, you know, Garrett Cole, like casually about him, his family, and he met his wife and they're expecting soon. And, um, those kinds of relationships, I just, I would have never created if I, if I would have gone straight out of high school, but, Obviously, I would have created other relationships. I just value um, that time, those three years at UCLA, probably more than any other time in my baseball career. I'd say that's pretty mature. It's hard for a lot of young guys, especially 18 years old, to see that short-term gratification um, and pass that up for, obviously, you know, longer-term, life-changing goals. So I think that's, that's definitely a, a sign of maturity, even at a younger age. It was pretty easy, too, when I had two examples of Trevor Bauer, who graduated high school early to get to UCLA. I had Garrett Cole, who was drafted 20th overall, something like that, and he chose to go to UCLA. So as a guy, he went in the sixth round. <laughs> like, it was a pretty easy call. You get first round, two first rounders that are going to college. I mean, it seems pretty easy. I should go to college, too. All right. Do you have a pretty good relationship with both of them? Obviously, Garrett Cole is, is widely regarded as – the best pitcher maybe in the world right now. And Trevor Bauer is uh, at the forefront of, of all uh, pitch design and, and analytics and kind of the new school. Those are two pretty big names that obviously you had a chance to watch from a young age uh, and get to, you know, work with them, live with them on a social, uh, on a social aspect. Do you still keep in touch with them? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, talked with uh, Trevor definitely in spring training and before and uh, doing a lot of um, off season stuff this uh, this off season, kind of redesigning some stuff and uh, retooling how I was moving. Like Trevor's an absolute great resource for that. And then uh, just Garrett, as far as his day to day routines of who he is as a major league pitcher, he's so fascinating because he's so um, he's so committed to his routines and he's so disciplined with his routines. I love to talk to him about that kind of stuff. So I've been really fortunate to be around a lot of really good. Um, baseball players and and guys that um you know have really shaped me not not just those two but coming up with Mike Clevenger and Haye like he goes about things way differently than I do and to see his process through it all that that was always interesting to me to come up with Corey Kluber and Josh Tomlin kind of leading the Cleveland Indians along with others um those two guys alone have set up a lot of who I am today as a major league pitcher. So every step of the way, I've, I've been really lucky to be around um, peers who are much better than me, <laughs> but uh, people that I can learn from as well. Yeah, that is so awesome. So awesome. You got something, Dan? Um, one has to go with, you know, following, I guess, the, the topic of success and always being on winning teams. So, you know, there's a point in spring training where you get option to, to triple a, um, almost, um, feels like you're being cut to a certain extent. And obviously you've had so much success. What is, um, I guess, what's a process or feelings or, or dynamics of you having to deal with that? um to eventually get to you know what you've done the past couple of years yeah I've been optioned a lot in my career um something in the ballpark of 12 or 13 times uh one season was six or seven times in one in one year um and you know it's not fun uh 100 I'm driving up and down I-71 and and going to Cleveland and, and so excited. And three days later, two days later, the next day, I'm driving back down to Columbus, shaking my head, like what went wrong or um, what could I do better? Sometimes there's nothing that went wrong and you just have to deal with that. And I think that's where being a really good self-evaluator comes into hand and not just looking at results. Cause there were times that I could go, six innings, give up two runs in the minor leagues and know that I didn't really pitch that well that day. Um, or I pitched an average day, but I didn't, I didn't pitch as well as those, those stat lines would indicate. And then there was times where in the big leagues where I'd give up four or five runs and, and look back like, man, what, what the heck? Like I was cruising, I was cruising, I was cruising. And all of a sudden I ran into some trouble and then my day was over. And um, I think, I think learning from who you who you actually were that day, not just what the line said, is is a ton um, that any young pitcher can learn from because it it severely helped me uh, between the even the 17 season where I was I was pretty terrible everywhere. <laughs> let's let's call it like it is. The 18 season um, I was much better and got option six times that year, and then in 19 I started down and and got optioned even in the middle of the season and um, finally got a chance and, and took it and ran. Right. So I, one thing that, uh, go ahead. I, I think that's so, that's so right. awesome. So valuable. Right. One thing that uh, Dan and I have done is we've, uh, we've graded execution for our guys. So every mm -hmm. pitch that they throw, whether it's a bullpen, a game, a sim game, whatever it is, is if their line looks great and their execution is below, you know, 65%, you know, we kind of go over that or, and then we'll take the actual uh, results out of it. So you throw, you know, you throw five pitches in an AB and four of them are balls and you get them out, right? That's kind of baseball or, or luck or kind of shows your stuff. Uh, and our guys have really taken to, to taken every pitch uh, as trying to, you know, execute to the highest degree. And it's something that's uh, really helped us and, and hearing it from a guy of your stature is really good to hear. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the biggest philosophies at UCLA as a whole is um, we win two out of three. We win two out of three first pitches. Um, we, we, you know, every every pitch that we throw, we throw two out of three for strikes. 
and it, it even seeps into we win two games on the weekend at a, at a minimum. And uh, if you do that across your entire season, that's a lot of success. Great. It's uh, a lot of similar, a lot of similar stuff that we talk about here. I want to go into um, the end of last year, um, probably your best stretch, you would say. Absolutely. Is there something that changed, something that clicked, a, a different attack plan? Can you kind of go into um, w- what you did? Uh, whether it was mental or physically to kind of see those results or was it uh, kind of a culmination of, of, of luck or, or how do you go into the end of last year? Yeah, this is where I'm super fortunate again in my career and I get drafted by the Cleveland Indians um, and I spend my entire career there. And having said that, they're one of the leading analytic and, and um, you know, pitch development and all this kind of stuff over any other team out there in my, in my opinion, I've not been everywhere else, but I've talked to a lot of guys who've come in and they all continue to say that, wow, this place is really different. And so sitting down in Detroit, actually, I'm about to make my next start and they show me side by side with Jake Odorizzi, um, starter for the twins. And then they put my numbers right, right directly next to his and, uh, you know, pitch analytics, just simple stuff like slugging percentage. Um, And then it's all broken down in the different zone areas and where does he pitch. And in 2019, he's an all-star. He's, you know, one of the best pitchers in the big leagues. And and what changed Um, from 2018, where he was an average major league pitcher, which is not easy to do. Average sounds like anybody can do it. I mean, Brad, I know you've been there. It's, It's not easy to be an average major league pitcher. And so they, they showed me what, who he was as an average pitcher, and he attacked the top of the zone with his fastball, and our two fastballs were almost identical. I mean, the, the vertical rise um, to get pretty technical, um, the, the location was the only major difference. I was still trying to throw down and away, and I was trying to throw down in the zone, down in the zone, and I was getting crushed down there. And... Finally, um, they said, just, just do it. Just try it. I mean, it's not like I, you know, it, it wasn't dire. Like you have nothing else to lose, but it was like, this works. Here's why it works. And here's a guy with the same velocity, the same movement profiles, and he's doing it better than he ever has. And he's a major league all-star. So why wouldn't you try it? And so I did. And then I go on this 12 start stretch where I'm just rolling, rolling, rolling. And and don't look back and carry that into spring training. And I've never been more comfortable um, on a major league mound, ready to face hitters every single night. And that's why I was so bummed when all of this COVID-19 stuff broke out. Um, I was ready. I was truly ready. I was confident. And I was, I was about to be who I always wanted to be as a major league pitcher. And I'm maintaining that now. And I'm still ready. And I'm still waiting for this to end. Um, everyone be safe, wash your hands, do all the right things. But um, that, that was by far the most frustrating part. And it's almost like being optioned again for me right now. I have to just sit and wait and wait for that call to come back around and, and uh, get ready to play in the big leagues again. Wow. Except that's, we all uh, got optioned at the same time. So that's a little different. Yeah, the whole, the whole world got optioned. It's unfortunate. Right. Yeah, we were actually, that's something I had written down about the Indians kind of, you know, we talk about big market versus small market teams and um, trying to gain advantages over some of the big market teams. And I think, you know, guys like you have definitely taken advantage of that. Uh, so that, that's great to hear. Kind of expanding on that, I had, we were talking about it a little bit before, but, um, you know, just your pitches in general, it's like you, you rely heavily on a, on, a, on your fastball, right? And mm-hmm. Um, and, and for all, for all intents and purposes, you know, this is becoming a game where, uh, strikeout numbers are very sexy to a lot, especially, you know, younger generation, uh, kids in high school and college. And, and you're still, still a guy that pitches, you know, almost half the time with your fastball. Um, can you kind of just give a little bit of insight to, to that? Yeah, I even used to be more um, fastball heavy at, at school. 
there was one start um, where I started against Oregon. I went nine innings. Um, I think it was my freshman year uh, through, I mean, this is a different time where, you know, it was more acceptable for pitchers to go a little bit longer. So I threw, I think it was like 120 pitches, 125 pitches. And I believe 90% of them were fastballs. And it was because I was locating well. Um, we were attacking the top of the zone when I needed to. I was attacking the bottom of the zone when I needed to. And I was just purely pitching with my fastball. And I've never been afraid to do that. And um, I think everybody uh, gets worried when their fastball gets touched by one hitter, then all the hitters are going to touch it. Every hitter's different. Every hitter's unique. Um, you know, it's, it's, I'm talking to a bunch of potentially college guys, but if you go to a casino and you see a roulette table, they always show you black, 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 right? Like seven times black hits in a row. That doesn't mean that red isn't about to hit. It's the chances are still the same, even though blacks hit that many times in a row. So the chances every single time that a hitter can hit my fastball are the same, whatever they may be for that individual. They don't change because I've thrown a lot of them. Um, having said that, that, you also have to be able to pitch backwards. You also have to be able to flat out pitch. And that's a conversation um, with Garrett Cole that I've had a million times about the Cleveland Indians. You look at Shane Bieber, Shane Bieber does nothing that is truly exceptional as far as velocity um, goes with his fastball. But he can pitch. He can throw all of his pitches where he wants to, when he wants to, and in any count. And that creates fits for hitters. Now, if you can do that at 97, then you're unbelievable. But Shane's doing it at a major league all-star level, throwing an average fastball of 93, 94. Right. Now let's uh, you have anything on that, you. Brad. No, I just kind of wanted to talk. So I got, I got traded when I was back in the minors from the White Sox to the Diamondbacks and the White Sox at that time were, almost no analytics, no data. I got traded the Diamondbacks. First thing they do is sit me down and, and show me my heat map, all my spin, all my break. Um, and they're like, all right, well, what you're doing is you're trying to run, you know, two seamers arm side. Um, it, it's kind of too high a spin. It's not really profiling very well, but your four seam has pretty good carry, especially the glove side. Um, what I'm getting at here is I never really had a plan. Um, I, I kind of knew my stuff was always – you know, a little bit above average, but I never really knew how to pitch with it. I get to Arizona and they're like, all right, just attack the top of the zone, glove side, throw your breaking ball up that they tunnel really well and see how it goes. Kind of what you said, you have to commit to it. Can you talk about how, like, I don't want to say freeing, but how confident and you, I, I kind of heard it in your voice, how confident yeah. you are to have a plan every time you go out there and knowing that you can execute a plan versus going out there somewhat blind every time, just, just hoping stuff wins. Yeah, 100%. I mean, first of all, credit yourself with slightly above average major league stuff. You were 97 to 100. You had a yacker and you had a pretty good <laughs> cutter. Like your stuff was your stuff was pretty unbelievable coming out of the pen late innings. But exactly like you said, as soon as you have a plan and as soon as somebody tells you, why, why haven't you done this? It's like, I mean, okay, like, so then for me, I go back to the drawing board. My bullpens are all about throwing fastballs down in the zone. Well, now I have to change that. I have to throw fastballs at the top of the zone, just like I have to throw fastballs at the bottom, bottom of the zone. If I don't practice throwing fastballs up and into righties, how can I expect when Miguel Cabrera is in the box that I need to throw fastballs up and in and I'm going to execute? So then it goes back to, for me, because I'm a starter, uh, bullpen guys are a little bit different, but – then all of a sudden my bullpens changed where um, I wanted to attack the top of the zone. I'd still practice my pitches at the bottom of the zone, especially off speed. Um, but I'm I, cutter has value up and into lefties that that pitch has a ton of value up there. And so I have to practice as if I'm throwing a cutter up and into lefties. Um, I have to practice all of these, um, these locations that I'm being told are, quality for me and I, maybe I haven't been practicing them um, before but that was a huge change just like you said um, it, it is very freeing and then it allowed me to work on something in a very direct path I need to get better at this and this is going to work for me perfect time for me to go to work and I will say 
throwing fastballs up isn't for everybody. If you have unbelievable sink, then you should throw the heck out of it at the bottom of the zone. If Luis Castillo, the, the righty for Cincinnati, if he were just to attack the up, uh, upper echelon of the zone, he, he could get away with it because he has some good velocity, but his success is going to come off of bottom of the zone sinkers. And I'm assuming a lot of this is is based on track man or rep soto. Are you are you big into rep soto in the off season, or do you get to throw on a track man where uh, at least we try to individualize everything, right? What works for Adam Plucko doesn't work for Brad Goldberg, doesn't work for Dan DeLucia. Um, so if you're talking about you know a low spin sidearm guy like Castillo, even though the velo is high, obviously we want to play down in the zone. Can you can you kind of elaborate on are you using the analytics uh, in the off season because obviously in season the the Indians take care of that. Yeah, definitely using the analytics. Definitely try and know my um, average, average, um, you know, vertical ride and, and horizontal movement um, on all pitches and then trying to expand where we can. Uh, curveball was a big point of emphasis um, this, this past off season where I was really trying to um, get a little bit more sweep, a little bit more Charlie Morton type curveball. Um, and obviously Ralph Soto plays a huge part in that, but don't forget just the feel of it, just trying to try different things, wrist positions, all this kind of stuff, along with the obvious of grips and how it's coming out of your hand. And are you mechanically sound? Are you using, uh, are you using like slow-mo cameras for your, uh, for your wrist orientation? I have, um, I'll be really honest. I don't get it. I don't understand. Like looking at it on video doesn't make sense of how do I fix it. That's still very old school for me. It's like, Hey, you're getting around the ball, you know, don't do that. And then I know what that feels like. It's like, Oh, okay. Like I need to go back and, and my wrist is probably cocked over too far towards uh, what would be as a right-hander first base side. And I, you know, I'm going to try and stay more neutral and even on this script. Um, I, I can look at slow-mo video all day long and I'll tell everybody in the world, most of the time I don't know how to translate it, but luckily I'm around a lot of people who do know how to translate it and then put it back into words for me um, that I understand. Dan, you want to elaborate on that? That's something that uh, we, we really try to, we try to tell our guys is, is we don't want them to have the information. We want to, for lack of a better term, dumb it down and make it very palatable and make them uh, the, the pitcher understand it the most so they can then teach themselves. Cause that's the end goal is, is kind of not coaching so they can be their own coach. Yeah. I think it's kind of the individual, like Adam, you, you mentioned like, and again, you're, it sounds like you're very self-aware, but you're also self-aware that, okay, slow-mo cameras don't make sense to you. So why would someone try to give you that information, you know, in that context where it's more verbal cues are going to work for you from a pitch grip standpoint or a release point standpoint. So um, I think that's something that that's valuable. And it, it's, I guess it's harder in a big organization like the Indians where there's, you know, hundred guys um, or whatever, top to bottom, but, you know, we're dealing with 16 guys where we really try to relate um, more one-on-one -on -one and individual know who each guy is um, and kind of coach them to that specific way. So um, I, I did talking pitches and, and grips and that we were talking a little bit about uh, your slider. So, you know, going on baseball savant, your sliders profiled as a slider. However, we were talking how you, you really called a cutter and more of that being a mindset. Um, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, for, I, I threw a slider my entire career until 2018 and I just, it was, it was inconsistent. It would be anywhere from 80 to 85, 86. And the shape wasn't consistent. My ability to throw up for strikes wasn't consistent. Um, there'd be great days with it. And uh, it was still the pitch that I'd throw more than any other pitch uh, when I was behind in counts and really for strikeouts as well. But um, it, it just wasn't consistent. And the more that we continue to talk. It seemed as if a cutter was going to be a really good um, pitch for me. And now it still does profile as a slider when TrackMan looks at it and all that kind of stuff, which is fine. But in my head, I'm trying to power through this pitch 
as if it's a fastball, um, a cut fastball, and and then the seam orientation and then the way it comes out of my hand takes over. And, and it can be anywhere from average velocity is about 86, 87 now, but I can get it up to, I threw it a couple times last year, 89, 90. And even this spring, I threw it a couple times uh, in, in that velocity as well. So I think that's most important is it allowed me to just throw the pitch and not or like worry about how it spins. And right. I mean, truly, if we're going by the numbers, it's about a 1045 to 1115 spin axis. So it's still a, a back spin pitch. It's no longer top spin or side mm -hmm. spin. There is some side spin. There is some, um, some side action to it, but it's still back spinning uh, quite like how my heater does because I'm such a vertical rise, uh, vertical rise guy. Yeah, makes sense. That's good stuff. Cool. Yeah. I, uh, we try to emphasize the, uh, sorry there, Brad. Um, go ahead. You know, it's more so like, and I think you were alluding to it when you get into a game mode game and it's time to, all right, we got to get guys out. All that information is really thrown out the window and it becomes more of the mentality and how you're throwing the pitches. You're not thinking about the spin axis or direction or the efficiency or anything like that. It's, I need to power through this pitch like I would a, like my forcing fastball and it's me versus you. I'm going to get you out. So I think that's yeah. Right. And, and for me, it became less, um, I like to do, I always make fun of uh, myself, but I like to do like pretty things. People would categorize, categorize how I pitch is like pretty and, you know, <laughs> I hit spots and I, right. you know, split right. the black and, and it's very pretty to watch. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I didn't need to shape my cutter. My cutter was my cutter was my cutter. It wasn't going to be bigger with two strikes and smaller when I needed it behind in the count. I wasn't going to just try and miss a barrel. Eventually I was just like, my cutter is my cutter is my cutter. And it's the same whether I have two strikes or whether I have no strikes or whether I'm three, one, the, the pitch right. is the same. Man, uh, that, is, that is so mature to hear. And obviously right. you're at the highest level, but we, we talk a lot about not trying to make stuff extra nasty. If you throw a quality pitch and it's your quality and they swing and miss or they take it, it doesn't, the next pitch doesn't have to be the greatest cutter in the history of baseball, right? Execution and trusting that your pitch can get the guy up. I love hearing that, man. Mm -hmm. No doubt. But we've talked in the past uh, a little bit. I know I picked your brain on the core velocity belt. Can you talk about some of the applications you use on that and kind of why you got into using uh, Lance's core velo belt? Yeah, I, um, for years, aimlessly, I've been trying to create more hip shoulder separation. I look on Twitter and everybody tells me that I need more hip shoulder separation. And I don't, I, I'm not a, uh, you know, medical expert. I don't understand kinesiology. So I uh, try and understand as best I can. And I happen to run across uh, Lance Wheeler and his core velocity belt. And I happen to, again, be fortunate that the Indians have a good relationship with Lance. And so this off season, I got to head down um, and, and go to his little, uh, uh, <laughs> it's like this little workshop. I like to call it a little lab. He's got like blue turf, like it's Boise State's football field in there or something. <laughs> uh, there's chains everywhere. It's a mess. It's awesome. It's the perfect, uh, it's the perfect place. And there's nets. And um, anyways, uh, I spent about an hour and a half with him. And I finally understood what hip shoulder separation to me means and it, it, it means every it, it means something different to everybody um you know for some guys if they can delay shoulder rotation then that opens up their hip um i again aimlessly tried to delay shoulder rotation for years and in turn probably screwed myself up more times than i needed to or i would try to lead with my hips you know as soon as i'm at the top of the delivery start spinning on my hips and then I'd fly open. Um, and, and for me, it ultimately just was turning my heel out a little bit away from the rubber and my toes more towards the rubber allowed me to carry the, the load of my hips, the strength that you get from the top of the top of your leg kick down, down into touchdown a lot longer. And then that itself created more hip shoulder separation along with, 
the physical work of getting more hip mobility, getting better T-spine mobility, um, spending and dedicating a lot of my off season in order to do that, not just lifting weights aimlessly, uh, really trying to become more mobile and more stable within those ranges of motion. Love hearing that, man. So you're kind of talking, I know Lance always talks about corkscrewing into the ground. You're kind of getting into that, that feeling where you're, you're kind of taking your cleats at three point of pressure and twisting them into the earth clockwise, correct? That's what you're kind of talking about, pushing your toes into the rubber. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I wouldn't even make it as complicated as, as that for me. Uh, if I'm thinking about anything on my back foot, I'm, I'm lost. Um, I, I need to very much focus out um, to, to what's in front of me. And, and that was, um, that was just, just feeling, um, as if I'm sitting into my, in, into my back hip and it's not a squat, it's a deadlift for anybody that's, you know, really understands what that means. It, it's not the front of your leg, it's the back of your leg. So I'm really trying to act as if I'm at the top of a deadlift and I'm about to do an RDL and kind of, and, and kind of take that that good core position down with me and the rest just takes care of itself if i'm if i'm putting intent and everything through that position the velocity and more importantly the consistency will show up with that because i'm using my glutes i'm using my hamstrings i'm using my much bigger muscles than um you know your quad muscle and and, and that will create a lot of inconsistencies if, if you're using the front side of your leg Really, really well said. Yep. Any other questions, Dan? I don't. I don't have. Uh, I know you're going to ask some just about on our our great city here of Columbus since <laughs> had some time. Yeah, that's what I want to know, buddy. What uh, what do you got on, on the city of Columbus? Now you've spent a little bit of time here with the AAA affiliate of the Indians. Uh, I live right next door in downtown. Can you uh, share some of your uh, whether it's food or coffee? I know you and I get along on that a lot because Columbus is very underrated in the uh, the food scene you're being really nice by saying i spent a little bit of time let's let's call a spade a spade i spent a lot of time in columbus i was not a quick mover through the system i might have gotten to columbus fairly quick but then i stayed in columbus for quite some time so worst uh, places my to be wife, though 100 yeah i mean there's there's a lot of worse places to be in the international league i was very lucky to spend most of my time in Columbus. Um, having said that, I mean, North Market alone has anything that you want and more. Um, anything in short north uh, is amazing. God, there's a pizza place about all G's? No, it's like a fancy pizza place. Uh, Forno. Italian. Forno. Forno's amazing. Wow. We would go there for. Um, Funny enough, their desserts like after games when my wife and my son weren't out yet, we'd go up to Forno. They have this uh, like pecan pie with a caramel drizzle on top. And, you know, um, every now and again, uh, not every night, but, you know, every other night or something, <laughs> we'd head up there and, and get some pecan pie. They had like a lemon bar too. That was insane. Everything up there was great. And I mean, you really can't go wrong. Uh, Fusion is one of my favorite places that I wish that we had here in Dallas just for like quick and easy sushi. Um, any arena district is, is a hotbed for sure. Love you, man. We, uh, we can't appreciate you coming on more, man. This was, uh, this was awesome on the pitch design process and, uh, we wish you the best of luck and hopefully this ends soon, real soon. Yeah. Thanks for having me guys. It was a lot of fun and, um, looking, looking forward to, uh, how you guys do with Ohio state, but not much, more than that because UCLA is where it's at. <laughs> so when uh, when you're an all-star this year, you could say it started uh, during the uh, global pandemic when you talked to us, all right? <laughs> Absolutely. That's that's exactly when I'll reference the, the start of your life. All right, man. Take care. Thanks, Plot. See you guys. Appreciate it. Yep.